crumbles. Tens of thousands march in Mauritius to demand the entire government's resignation. And people around the world continue to protest against COVID-19 restrictions. Hello and welcome to Talisuram Durst following Quito, Ecuador and this is from the South. Brazil's beleaguered Lava Jato special investigation team is seeing more of its members resign due to numerous irregularities by those in charge. One of the main accusations against the special prosecutors is that their work has been biased against left-wing figures. After the parliamentary coup against Dilma Rousseff and the imprisonment of Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva, the Lava Jato special investigation is changing course. Delta Dalagnol, the task force coordinator who was at the head of the investigation, recently resigned, worn out by numerous bias complaints. In addition, seven prosecutors in Sao Paulo requested their collective dismissal following the arrival of figures linked to President Bolsonaro. As such, the operation is being moved to Rio de Janeiro, a city which in many ways belongs to the Bolsonaro family. In politics, positions are never empty. They are always filled. It is the same in the judicial system. We are seeing the downfall of Lava Jato, but specifically of the Delta and the Lagnol team, as he just resigned, same as Sergio Moro and his position as a judge. Lava Jato is in decline due to an internal dispute with the attorney general. There is fight between the Attorney General's office and the Lava Jato Task Force, which is also a fight between Bolsonaro and Moro. The exit of former Justice Minister Sergio Moro from Bolsonaro's inner circle caused cracks in Brazil's right wing. At the same time, Congress is debating the use of lawfare by the judicial system, a debate which could lead to ban on judges running for political office until eight years have passed since they were public servants, shutting out Moro from fulfilling his ambitions. The main political currents now are against Lava Jato. Moro was left without representation, without work. He is at this moment a zombie in the political scenario. I don't think he could serve as a candidate for any important position in the next elections. I don't see how he could make a presidential candidacy viable. At this moment, he is not a choice for the elite class. The Supreme Court may vote in the next few days to suspend Moro as a judge due to the accusations of bias, and in turn, newly find the sentence against Lula da Silva. Two of the judges have already voted against the Moro suspension, and another two are expected to vote in favor. The tie-breaking vote is in the hands of Judge Celso de Mello, but he asked for a leave of absence for an undetermined time due to health reasons. On November 1st, he will retire and Bolsonaro will nominate another judge for the Supreme Court. The trial already took too long, but it's good that it hasn't been resolved yet because in the meantime, we started to discover major irregularities in the way the Lava Jato Task Force carried out its duties. They are guilty of major violations of the law, in particular the close relationship between the prosecutors and the judge put in charge of the investigation. Fortune seems to be on the side of former President Lula da Silva, as he was recently acquitted in a case where he was accused of taking bribes from a construction company Odebrecht. As the chess pieces move, the only thing that can have a major impact in Brazil's political scenario is the annulment of moral sentences against Lula by the Supreme Court, which would allow the former president to run for office. The fact that Lula could be a presidential candidate is a major upset for the ruling party, and it would immediately lead to a powerful polarization between the far right represented by Bolsonaro and the left wing represented by Lula. It would also cause major waves among centrists, as they would lose political power. But Lula is running out of time. He has a month and a half for the Supreme Court to vote on the annulment of moral sentences against him before President Bolsonaro nominates another Supreme Court judge. 
The world's largest tropical wetland area located in Brazil's Pantanal region is being consumed by massive forest fires. Authorities have been unable to contain the fires which have been spreading for weeks and have already consumed tens of thousands of acres. The fires reportedly started at the hands of local ranchers and farmers who for years have been clearing land for agriculture, cattle farming and logging. On top of this, drought conditions have worsened the situation. Experts agree that this year's wildfires in the Amazon could set a new record for destruction in one of the most biodiverse areas in the world. Our correspondent in Sao Paulo, Brad Meir, has the latest. This year I traveled up to Rondonia during the worst fire crisis in over a decade to give coverage for Telesur. And this year, although all of the media is looking at California right now, the fires underway in the Amazon region in Brazil and in the Pantanal wetlands region are just as bad, if not worse, than they were last year. There's over 20,000 different individual fires burning in the state of Mato Grosso right now, according to the Brazilian Space, Space Agency. And it's important to know that these fires are all man-made. There's no such thing as natural forest fires in the Amazon biome. Now, when Bolsonaro was elected, he immediately started giving out messages to his friends and supporters in the logger, the soy, and the beef industries that he was not going to enforce environmental regulations in the Amazon region. And what we see now is continued impunity as loggers and ranchers start fires on indigenous reservations like the Shingu, which is burning out of control right now, and in national parks. So they can enter afterwards and clear the remains for soy and beef production. Prime Mayor bringing us that report. Now, protests against police brutality in Colombia continued for a fourth day straight on Saturday. The demonstration was sparked by the alleged sexual abuse of three women in a police station in Bogota. Widespread protests began last week after a video spread on social media showing a man being tortured hours before he died in police custody. Since the mobilizations began, at least 13 people have been killed and more than 400 were wounded by security forces. Here today, the feminist movement is mainly gathered rejecting these actions because we are tired of being repressed by a military force a violent, repressive force with shields, with firearms, with tanks. We came here because the police centers and the police force are torture entities financed by the state, of which the victims are women, non-binary people, trans people, black people, people who live on the streets. The Chilean government has extended the state of exception for a second time by 90 days. The decree will continue to restrict a number of citizen rights, including the right to hold gatherings. It was also announced less than a day after police heavily repressed mobilizations commemorating the 1973 military coup. Now, according to authorities, the extension hopes to protect citizens from the COVID-19 pandemic. Moving on, Trinidad and Tobago will not reopen its borders anytime soon, and all restrictions implemented to stem the spread of COVID-19 will remain in place until October 11th. That's according to Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley. To date, the country has recorded 3,019 cases of the novel coronavirus and 53 deaths. All the arrangements remain in place. Um, I know we are tempted to want to go to the beaches and the rivers, let us hold on a bit and um, today is the 12th of so we will maintain this posture for another month and uh, um, by the 28th we will review but but by, by the 28th we will be halfway there that's another for another 14 day period and we will have to do another review then Hopefully, all things being equal, all disciplines and protocols being observed, by the 28th, we will have a view which will give us what the month of September look like, and we can compare September with August, and we will then have um, that other 14-day period going into October. If any adjustments can be made then, we would consider it then, but as of now, we are not... 
um, minded to make any adjustments to what we are doing. We'll take a short break now. Don't go away. Welcome back. Written with news from Africa. Mauritius witnessed the largest protest rally in 40 years as citizens took to the streets to demonstrate against the government's handling of a recent oil spill. About 25,000 people marched in the city of Mahiburg for the second time in a month, calling for the resignation of Prime Minister Pravin Jugnath and his government. The demonstrators blamed the administration for mishandling the oil spill caused by a 1,000-ton Japanese fuel tank which was shipwrecked off the island's coast back in July and spilled its contents. The spill has inflicted untold damage on the Indian Ocean archipelago, which depends on its fabled coastline for fishing and ecotourism. Speaking of oil, diesel stations in the Libyan city of Benghazi have closed down as the country undergoes a severe fuel crisis. Long queues of vehicles can be seen outside fueling stations waiting to obtain diesel amid a fuel crisis in oil-rich Libya. Distributors have attributed the shortage to the delay of marine tankers that bring fuel into the country. The delays have also forced refineries to suspend operations. We as ordinary citizens are hurt by the diesel crisis badly hurt and now the diesel dealers are controlling the situation filling containers cans and everything with diesel and they are selling those containers someone called me and told me that he was ready to buy a diesel container for 500 or 600 libyan dinars he can buy it with no problem but others cannot now for what can be described as some positive news on the oil commodity front, Uganda has reached an agreement with the French oil company Total that will see the construction of a crude oil pipeline to neighboring Tanzania. Under the agreement, a 900 mile East African crude oil pipeline is set to be constructed at a cost of $3.5 billion. Uganda discovered crude oil reserves 14 years ago, but commercial production has been delayed due to a lack of infrastructure. I want to assure Ugandans uh, that this is a deliberate uh, step by us. After careful study, there were some issues about tax here, tax this one, tax. But uh, having gone through every item, our strategy is that we start now. In other news, the South African Communist Party has said the impact of the coronavirus pandemic has exacerbated the social and economic inequalities in the country. In a communique published at the conclusion of its two-day virtual summit, the party's central committee noted that the pandemic has worsened the pre-existing crisis of high poverty levels, unemployment, and other social ills. The party also denounced the recent looting of public funds, saying the rampant scourge of corruption and unethical behavior across all sectors has had a devastating effect on the livelihoods and survival of millions of citizens. There have also been outrageous negative features as well. None more so than the looting of public resources intended for dealing with the health crisis, like the up to 800% markups on health equipment by rent-seeking tenderpreneurs in a number of instances, or the theft of personal protective equipment, PPEs. These are actions that the World Health Organization's Director General has rightly, rightfully described as akin to murder. Unfortunately, these wanton acts of corruption are just one more particularly awful example of the rampant scourge of corruption and unethical behavior across much of the public and private sectors. Staying in South Africa, the city of Cape Town has been able to cope with the effects of a lengthy drought season thanks to a dam that, for the first time in years, is at capacity. The Berg River Dam, one of the nation's main water sources, is just one of a number of dams that are holding water 
at well over 95% of their capacity. Now, this is the first time that the city's dams have been filled to capacity since 2014. And according to experts, this is thanks to improved water management by the city. But this might not be the case for longer, as seasonal changes will bring warmer weather and less rainfall. In the face of this, officials are urging all residents to maintain the water-wise approach. Dams are full and it is a sight that we're all ecstatic about because we haven't uh, seen this uh, since about 2014 when we had all of those dams almost full. They're about 95%. Some of them are, are full and they obviously all vary. Uh, but it is very uh, amazing change given the fact that we were right at this day zero and we're concerned uh, in 2018, round about January, whether we'd even make it through till the next winter rain. So it's an amazing turnaround. Mali's military junta has pledged to establish an 18-month transition government that will lead the country to civilian rule after last month's coup. The junta, opposition parties, and civil society organizations have been meeting since Thursday to chart the way forward for the nation. But the most contentious issue remains whether the transition government will be headed by a civilian or a soldier. We make a commitment before you to spare no effort in the implementation of all these resolutions in the exclusive interest of the Malian people. We request and hope for the understanding, support and assistance of the international community in this diligent and correct implementation of the transition charter and roadmap. Ivory Coast's main opposition Democratic Party of Côte d'Ivoire has nominated Henry Conan Bédier as its candidate for the upcoming presidential elections. The party formalized Bédier's candidacy during a rally held in the capital Yamoussoukro. The election, slated for October 31st, will see the incumbent Alassane Utara, who is seeking a third term in office, face off against former President Laurent, Laurent Gbagbo and former rebel leader Guillaume Soro. The Zimbabwean ruling party, ZANU-PF, has accused the Opposition Movement for Democratic Alliance, or MDA, of training insurgents in Eastern Europe. ZANU-PF's Acting Secretary for Information and Publicity, Patrick Chinamasa, claimed that the country's largest opposition party is sending its youths for militant training in Serbia and Moldova. He further alleged that the MDC alliance is planning to destabilize the country through violent protests and acts of sabotage. That the MDC has been training, sending to Serbia and Moldova renegades who are being trained to prepare Molotov cocktails to come and cause mayhem and violence in our country. I wanted to say to BT and Chamisa, don't play with fire like little children. We're taking one last break. We have more stories coming up, so stay with us. Welcome back. A new camp for migrants has been set up in the Greek island of Lesbos after a fire destroyed the previous largest migrant camp in Europe. Over 11,000 people, including 4,000 children, had been living in the notoriously overcrowded and unsanitary Moira camp before it burned down last week. Saturday saw hundreds of asylum seekers rise up and demand their freedom. But this was followed by security forces heavily repressing the protests. Meanwhile, only a few people remain at the Moira camp. While some asylum seekers have already moved to the new camp, most are being forced to sleep rough until their transfer. On Saturday afternoon, hesitant queues formed at the new camp of Karatep. Police said around 200 migrants had checked in, while dozens, mostly families, were waiting outside for hygiene and safety checks. Nothing, just this uh, two, three family, maybe single man here, uh, Syria people, uh, four families is Afghanistan. 
All people left for Karatabba. Moria finished, don't have anything legal here. The Saudi-led military coalition has attacked barracks and military positions belonging to Houthi rebels in the outskirts of Yemen's capital, Sana'a. The attack or attacks come a few days after the Houthis claimed that they had struck an important target in the Saudi capital, Riyadh. The fighting between the two sides has killed more than 100,000 people and displaced millions others. The conflict began in 2014 when the Houthis took over the Yemeni capital and most other cities after ousting the Saudi-backed government of Abd Rabu Mansur Hadi. The U.S.-backed coalition, led by Saudi Arabia, has been trying to restore Hadi back to power ever since. Hundreds of people protested in Pakistan over the way authorities have handled a gang rape case. Women took to the streets to denounce that rape has been normalized and the cases are continuously ignored by officials. On Wednesday, a woman, a woman said she was raped by multiple men in front of her two children when her car ran out of fuel near the eastern city of Lahore. The city's police chief faced backlash after he seemed to blame the victim because she was driving at night without a male companion. So I'm here to protest for all the women of Pakistan. We've been facing a lot of rape cases that have actually been normalized by Pakistan. They've been continuously ignored by a government on and on again. We see the government coming out for whatever the mullahs want to say. They come out and they protest and the government just listens to them. It's the most difficult thing, the fact that I need to think twice before deciding whether I want to go somewhere or not is just beyond me because this is my country too, these are my streets, this is my road just as much as it is of any man and I don't see them thinking twice before they leave or they do anything. Well, several people have been arrested in Melbourne, Australia following protests against the COVID-19 lockdown. Those present at the rally said they are not happy with the restrictions put in place to reduce the spread of the virus, which they say are an infringement on their freedoms. Australia has over 26,000 COVID-19 cases and more than 800 deaths. The anti-restrictions movement has been gaining steam across the world, as countries like Germany, Poland and the U.S. are seeing more and more citizens express skepticism about the virus and the measures put in place to combat it. The movement is made up of a number of groups from self-declared free thinkers to anti-vaccine campaigners, conspiracy theorists and far-right activists. The challenge we face is unprecedented. We don't, no one is enjoying the reality we face, but none of us have the option of ignoring the reality that we face. We cannot open up now and stay open. It would not be safe. It would not be smart. We're not here to cause any trouble. We just want our rights and our freedoms. We had it before. Where did they go? Look at this tyranny. At least 33 people have died so far as a result of wildfires ravaging the west coast of the United States. At least 12 states have been affected by the fires, which are being intensified by a severe drought. Authorities say they expect the death toll to rise as firefighters haven't been able to reach some of the most affected areas. Images of the fire shocked the world this past week as many cities in the West Coast saw the sky turn orange and citizens reported large amounts of smoke coming down from the mountains. In other news, parliamentary elections will soon take place in Venezuela Thanks to the ongoing dialogue between the government and opposition parties, these ballots will see the participation of a wide variety of candidates representing numerous sectors. Let's take a closer look at how these elections are coming together. The National Electoral Council has made numerous modifications to December's ballots, including changes to the guidelines and the number of seats to be chosen. We are developing an electoral schedule that answers to these new special norms. These norms are seeking to strengthen our political system and the balance that must it is core. The number of seats in the National Assembly is being raised from 167 to 277 while maintaining the 87 electoral circuits for Venezuela's 24 states. 
Another change is how candidates are being elected, as 52% will be elected individually as representatives of a single seat constituency, while the remaining 48% will be elected as part of a political party. The opposition remains in a highly fragmented state. We are seeing that many political players are going to take part, some in alliance with the government, some not. What this means is that, in the end, the National Assembly will prove to be much more politically diverse, representing a wider spectrum of political ideologies. The modifications were agreed upon after talks between the ruling party and opposition sectors. They are also seeking to give prominence to newly established political movements that distance themselves from extremism. The government is allowing for great participation, respecting our democracy. They are also trusting political organizations to accept their results and to work for their constituents. The number of political parties taking part in these ballots has also increased to 107, and a new system to select indigenous lawmakers is also being established. Over 14,000 candidates have registered for these elections, as 90% of all active political parties are set to take part as well. And with that, we've come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net. For viewers in Africa, remember you can join us on Starsat, Starsat channel and join us on social media. For Telesur English, I am Doris Polo. Thank you for watching. <laughs>